Thank you, Grace and Chris, for that wonderful uh, introductory music. Uh, it's Brahms, Hungarian Dance Number no. 5. It's the perfect introduction to our service this morning. So good morning and welcome to Mount Vista Unitarian Universalist Congregation. My name is Zsombor Zoltán, and I am the pastoral associate today. We assist our minister, Reverend Matthew Funk Crary, who's on vacation. As we usually begin, let's acknowledge the people who work behind the scenes to make sure that all goes well every Sunday. I want to again thank Grace uh, and uh, Chris uh, Tackett for their beautiful pre uh, prelude. Chris is our wonderful music director, choir master, and pianist. That flute, Grace, is so lucky to be played by the magical flautist. Uh, let's also appreciate Lee and Todd McNeely and Vince Sinsky, who operate our audiovisual equipment, and Susan Alexander, who is our camera, oops, Vince is our camera operator, operator today. 
We also recognize our greeter team welcoming us and new visitors every Sunday. Stacy Sosa is our religious education director engaging our children. We also appreciate our song leader, Joel Yelland, uh, who offers us vocal encouragement. Joel also volunteers uh, as the service host in our kitchen, making coffee and treats ready for our after service uh, social time. And let's keep in mind those volunteers who help clean up afterwards. I also want to greet our fellow congregants joining us on Zoom today. And we thank our Zoom host. Is that Susan today? Oh, it's Alex. Alex, thank you, Alex. Now, in the spirit of community, uh, I invite those of us in the sanctuary to turn around, face the camera, and wave to our Zoom congregants to let us all feel our collective unity. I have invited uh, our church greeter, Peter Bechkehazi, my fellow Hungarian, to participate in today's service with me. I also wish to, uh, I wish to thank Robin Bausel, Lori Rayhart, Todd and uh, Lee McNeely, Derek Contreras, Samer Adi, and especially Cassandra Klein for their help with my presentations this past week. I began this welcoming introduction by pronouncing my name, Jombor Zoltan. I'd say it's obviously not a common name in American society. Uh, it was a hard name to grow up with. I've also shared that I'm of Hungarian descent. I'm a first-generation Hungarian immigrant coming to the United States at the age of six in 1951. But I'm more than a Hungarian. I'm a Transylvanian Hungarian. That is the roots of both of my parents and deeper genealogical lineage. Transylvania is a beautiful mountainous uh, region in Central Europe nestled in the eastern corner of the Carpathian Mountains, located in present-day Romania. The cartographers of the ancient Roman Empire gave it this name. Transylvania was part of the Roman province of Dacia, in which it was necessary to cross steep mountains, today called the Transylvanian Alps, which were covered with extensive inhospitable forests. Hence, the name literally translates from Latin as across the forest. This region, the Transylvanian Plateau, was abundant in salt deposits, iron ore, gold, and silver. We Hungarians call it Arde, and its Hungarian inhabitants call themselves the Sekai people. Most of them for centuries have been pious, agrarian, but highly intelligent, literate, independent, and self-reliant people. As you see, I'm wearing the clothing that is typical of what Transylvanian men wear, uh, uh, even today, usually on Sundays or special holidays. Transylvania was ceded to Romania from Hungary after the breakup of the Austro-Hungarian uh, 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 breakup of the Austro-Hungarian, a true political misnomer that is the Austrian Habsburg Empire. After World War I, there was a great redrawing of borders and the creation of new European countries were established by the victorious allies and to be implemented in 1920. Hungary lost two thirds of its 1000 year long territory with the formation of Yugoslavia and Czechoslovakia as well as the transfer of this huge area, our Transylvania, in which few Romanian-speaking people lived at the time. It was awarded to Romania for switching from being neutral to siding with the Allies in the middle of the First World War. Upon learning of this, the Axis powers quickly isolated Romania, and it added little to the Allied victories, yet it was well rewarded. After a few decades, these newly created countries have broken apart. Yugoslavia was a tenuous state, and eventually the terrible 
uh, Croatian, Serbian, Bosnian, and Kosovo wars of the late 1990s resulted. Even Czechoslovakia separated into two independent states, the Czech Republic and Slovakia, in an amicable divorce. I hope you guys all remember all this because you'll have a pop quiz after the service. <laughs> I have a bit more to say. I want to thank and acknowledge a person I'm sure many of you have heard about, Bram Stoker. He was a late 19th century Irish author writing in Victorian England when thick, heavy Gothic novels were all the rage. The grandiose, lengthy books were the IMAX and cinemascopes of the time, the big screens created in your mind and personal imagination. I want to thank Bram for putting Transylvania on the map of the Western world's geographical consciousness when he published his magnum opus, Dracula. Oops, that's where it belongs. <laughs> to quote Wikipedia, Dracula is an epistolary novel written as a collection of realistic but completely fictional diary entries, telegrams, letters, ship logs, and newspaper clippings, all of which added a level of detailed realism to the story, a skill which Stoker had developed as a newspaper writer. At the time of its publication in 1897, the book was considered a straightforward horror novel based on imaginary creatures and supernatural life. It gave form to a universal fantasy and has become a part of popular culture." End quote. In relatively recent times, the modern Romanian state confabulated the identity of Dracula with Vlad Tepes, a real minor historic figure, a homicidal, sadistic, egomaniacal, lesser prince of a small realm on the other side of the Carpathian Mountains in Wallachia, which is the true core of modern Romania. In reality, Bram Stoker never set foot in Transylvania and had minimum knowledge of the history, culture, and true spirituality of the people living there. He invented a mythical Eastern European country to emphasize the superiority of British society. And an additional major culprit, of course, is Hollywood. The Romanian Tourist Bureau today loves the US dollars, British pounds, and euros it collects from the gullible who visit. I bring all this up because I want to talk about the first ever religion to be formally recognized and ultimately named Unitarian, which emerged in Transylvania due to a unique set of historic, human, geographic, and political circumstances. I will have more to say about this later. I wish I had no need to express a preamble to any reference to Transylvania Whenever I say that word, I bemoan the popular cultural distortions of that beautiful place and its people where I have actually visited quite a few times in my life. How many of you as past members of other American UU churches had a partner church with a Transylvanian Unitarian church? I see a few hands. And how many of you participated in a pilgrimage to your Transylvanian partner church and actually visited there? A few hands. I hope my presentation today reignites the feelings of sanctity you may have experienced in that pilgrimage. And for the rest of us, I hope to create a feeling of kinship and deeper understanding. I also want you to know that I have a personal perspective on Transylvanian Unitarianism. I am the grandson and great-grandson of two Transylvanian Unitarian ministers who dedicated their lives to, uh, to their congregants and were part of the continued struggle to help this numerically small Transylvanian denomination 
uh, survive its more than 450 years of unrelenting adversity and contributed to the successful survival of Transylvanian Unitarianism to the present day. We will now light our chalice, and Peter Bechkehazi will have a few words. First of all, <clears throat> I sadly announce the passing of our longtime MVU member, Cheryl Hiller. Some of you may have seen the announcement. Reverend Matthew is in touch with the family and will provide further details soon. Our American Unitarian Universalist symbol is the flaming chalice, as you all know. The chalice represents a cup from which flows our sense of love, justice, and integrity. The flame represents the fire of our commitment, both to each other in our congregation and with the flames spreading light by serving the larger community with our care, compassion, and calls to justice. Some of us know that the origin of the symbol traces back to Europe during the Second World War, where the flaming chalice was a symbolic emblem posted on safe houses for those seeking safety from Nazi oppression. Notice on our video screen, the picture of the Transylvanian Unitarian emblem. It shows a dove perches, perched on a mountaintop surrounded by an encircling serpent and above a golden crown. The dove represents peace, the serpent, wisdom. The basis of this emblem comes from the New Testament, specifically the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 10, verse 16, where Jesus is speaking to his disciples and is instructing them about the difficulties ahead as they are about to spread his message. His message of radical love, quote, Behold, I send you forth as sheep in the midst of wolves. Be ye therefore wise as the serpent and innocent as the dove. The mountain represents what we can all reach, the summit of our aspirations, and the crown serves as a remembrance of the king of Hungary and Transylvania, John Sigismund, who proclaimed Unitarian as his faith, and who was the first to have granted the right in his realm in 15. 68, the freedom to choose among the then four recognized Christian denominations, which included Unitarianism. For the next 450 years, this emblem and its symbology have sustained the Transylvanian founder community through unimaginable hardships and suffering, yet they survive and endure to this present day. I had the opportunity to visit Transylvania three times and to meet with several Unitarian congregations there, including the one where Jean Bourg's grandfather had served as minister for many years. And when Jean Bourg and I compared notes, we just nearly fell over at this coincidence. I certainly felt I was resting on our, in our Unitarian history during those memorable trips. Let us light our chalice in acknowledgement that we, North American Unitarian Universalists, share a long spiritual kinship with those Unitarians who are our forebearers and who, for most of their history, did not have the benefit of an enlightened open society which grants anyone to freely choose one's faith to which one can willingly belong. We will now have a meditation. The Transylvanian Unitarians have a simple motto which is predominantly displayed in every sanctuary, Edj az Isten. This translates to God is one. 
Transylvanian Unitarianism formally dates back to 1568 as part of the great Protestant Reformation initiated by Martin Luther in 1517. Transylvanian Unitarianism is still fundamentally God-centric in its theology. In Hungarian, the predicate often precedes the subject noun. So this, a direct translation of Egyazisten is one is God. I interpret this direct translation to mean the unity of everything in the universe, the interrelationship of all existence, the spirituality that lives in each one of us. Let us meditate for a moment on the thought that we are a unity of human beings inhabiting one planet, united by common and true ancestral lineage of all human beings and all living things, uh, from the past to the present to a hopeful, beneficent future that still awaits us all. Breathe in, breathe out, breathe in, breathe out. Breathe in, breathe out, done. Let us now rise and sing from my gray hymnal number 352. We find the spirit and Joel will lead us. As I mentioned earlier, both my grandfather and great-grandfather were Unitarian ministers in Transylvania. This is my grandfather. His name was Shandor Zoltan. This is his church. A closer view. A, close, a closer view. The interior, that's how you spell homorod sent my phone. This is my, my great-grandfather, Shandor Gargay. This is his church board. He's in the center there. This was his church. The interior. 
another picture of the interior. Now, <clears throat> I never met my great-grandfather. Uh, he, he had seven children, and his youngest, a daughter, was my grandmother. One day, my, friend, my father invited his father, that is my grandfather, to come visit us in our Detroit suburban home all the way from Arde. My grandfather's name was Shandor Zoltan. My father paid his travel expenses, and my grandfather arrived in June of 1975 when he was 87 years old. I visited on several occasions uh, during my grandfather's three-week stay. We had wonderful conversations, but those few hours were the only time I ever spent with him. Regrettably, I also never met any of my other three grandparents. A week ago, I was preparing today's presentation on my patio early in the morning while it was still relatively cool. I was struggling on how to compress and edit the huge volume of information I wanted to relate into the limited time of a church service. Without noticing it as the temperature was rising and reaching above 100 degrees, I suddenly found myself getting very sleepy. I don't usually take a nap, but now I really needed it. Sometime during my nap, I began dreaming. I dreamt that my grandfather and great-grandfather pulled up chairs next to my bed and were saying to me, let us tell you the story of Transylvanian Unitarianism. Once upon a long, long time ago, in a land far, far away called Arde, a beautiful mountainous forested kingdom, there lived a young king, John Sigismund II, Janos Zsigmund in his Hungar native Hungarian, a young man in his early 20s. He was not married, but lived with a politically shrewd mother, Isabella Jagleon, a woman of Polish and Italian lineage. The people of Arde were composed primarily of two ethnic groups, German-speaking Saxons and the Hungarian Sekai people. The Saxons had been encouraged to come to Transylvania starting in the 12th century because they had stonemasonry, mining, and other critical occupational experiences. These were the high-tech skills of the times. They had been granted self-ruled charters around seven fortified towns, and to this day called themselves Siebenburgers, citizens of the seven municipalities. The Seke people were mostly yeoman farmers, independent small landholders scattered in villages along the many river valleys throughout Transylvania. At this time, the social structure of Europe was characterized as the feudal system, whereby the vast majority of people were serfs, enslaved, tied to baronial estates from which they could never leave. But the Sekes were the guardians of the Carpathian passes and were the first line of defense against the frequent incursions of invading armies from the eastern opposite side of the Carpathian mountains. At the time of King Zygmunt in 1556, the Ottoman Turks were the, uh, were the primary invading, uh, invading power. They had accepted Islam. The Siebenburgers and the Seke pe people pretty well kept to themselves, but generally had good relations at the upper level of their respective communities and collaborated in periodic diets, a word here meaning a formal deliberative assembly. The Ottoman Turks had already occupied about 80% of Hungary, but had allowed Transylvania to be an independent vassal state because they could play the Transylvanian monarchy against the Turks' most formidable enemy, the Habsburg dynasty, centered in Vienna. Let's keep in mind that a tremendous conflict was raging throughout Europe already for half a century, the Protestant Reformation. Before that year, Transylvania, as well as all of Western Europe, was predominantly a Roman Catholic region with an established Jewish population. 
All rural Catholic churches were surrounded with fortifications, high stone walls and bastions, encircling, encircling the church structure itself. This was necessary for the local population's protections against the centuries-long incursions of nomadic invaders. In the major cities surrounded by strong defensive walls, much larger self-standing cathedrals could be constructed. The Siebenburger population were well aware of the reforms initiated by Martin Luther, a fellow German Saxon. It wasn't long for Lutheranism to take a strong hold amongst the Siebenburger population. In the city of Kolozhvar, the largest of the Siebenburger communities, about 1520, was born Franz David Hertel. Uh, we American Unitarians know that name as Francis, da Francis David. I will refer to him by using the Hungarian pronunciation, Ferenc David. Let's bring in a little biography. Ferenc David was born to a Hungarian mother and a Saxon father, a humble shoemaker. Ferenc spoke both languages fluently. He was a bridge between both cultures. When he reached adulthood, he decided to become a Catholic priest. He was, of course, fluent in Latin also. He developed a keen interest in theology and so decided to memorize the entire Bible. Memorizing biblical scriptures requires repeating over and over again every verse and every page, a monumental task. But memorizing couldn't help but cause a person to deeply reflect on every passage. Has anyone, anyone here ever attempted to read the Bible in its entirety and was actually able to do it? <laughs> Now imagine trying to memorize it. Ophelius David was known to possess tremendous oratorical skills. He could quote scripture and make relevant comments about meaning and applicability. He was noticed by several wealthy merchants and they arranged for Ferenc to attend the University of Wittenberg on full scholarship and paid living expenses. Wittenberg. The rector there was none other than Martin Luther himself. After several years at Wittenberg, Ferenc returned to Kolozhvar, a fully converted Lutheran. He had mastered the fine theological disputations and the rejection of the infallibility of popes. In short order, his knowledge and oratory capabilities made him preacher of the largest Transylvanian Lutheran congregation in Kolozhvar's St. Michael's Cathedral, which was originally a Catholic church built between 1316 and, 18, and 1487. This brings to mind a very significant issue that occurred throughout the Protestant Reformation. Who would own the physical church building? Churches and cathedrals were considered houses of God that had to be beautiful, inspirational, reverential, Construction time took decades and centuries, not to mention their enormous costs. The struggle for the possession of church real estate was an extremely contentious issue, as you can imagine. Within two years, Ferenc David became the bishop of all the Lutheran churches in Transylvania. But soon after, David became aware of the theological works of John Calvin around 1560. There is no documentation that they had ever met or even corresponded. But the scholarly mind of David studied Calvin's reforms and saw them as being truer to his own questioning mind. David renounced his high-ranking Lutheran position and began advocating Calvinist reforms. The Siebenburgers resisted, but many Transylvanian Hungarians quickly accepted Ferenc's persuasions and he was able to organize several hundred new Calvinist congregations. And again, many of the previous Catholic churches throughout Transylvania were preempted by David's followers, and they also soon elected him to be their superintendent. I'm not going to elaborate 
on the ecclesiastic differences between these denominations. But these issues were the highest intellectual matters during that era throughout Europe. King Zygmunt became so impressed with Ferenc David that he invited him to become the court preacher. The king was now in his late 20s. His mother, Isabella, had invited an Italian-born doctor named Giorgi Biondrata to be her personal physician. Biondrata was a secret non-Trinitarian. Biondrata came from a long line of underground non-Trinitarian believers going back before the Council of Nicaea of 325 AD, where the definitive creed of Christianity, the doctrine of the equal nature of the Holy Trinity, was solidly confirmed. Biondrata's conversations with David's extensive biblical knowledge and awareness of multiple contradictions in spiritual texts convinced Ferenc of the validity of Biondrata's viewpoints. The highest conceivable entity is only God, one and indivisible. Jesus and the Holy Spirit could not be of equivalent nature. It would take too much theological commentary to explain how David rationalized this radical new conviction. Obviously, this revisionist idea greatly diminished the mystical complexity of traditional Christian dogma and made it more fundamental and easier to accept. Thereafter, David brought the matter into the open and began influencing first King Zygmunt and then his Calvinist-based congregations. This did not go easily. It was naturally unsettling within all of the, the Transylvania communities. King Zygmunt accepted his court preacher's new persuasion. He converted. However, his realm now contained traditional Catholics, uh, a substantial Lutheran population, and numerous Calvinist Reformed congregations. How to promote David's new religion? The king decided to organize traveling debating contests in which a representative of the Catholic Church, one from the Lutherans and one from the Calvinists, and Ferenc David himself would go together from region to region throughout Transylvania, debate, and let each listening individual decide for himself which religion he would accept. These debates were conducted in the language of their respective communities, not in Latin, so the people could easily understand the points. No need to mention, Ferenc most often won the day. Ferenc was able to convince a majority in several hundred villages to accept his non-Trinitarian theology. In reality, the Catholic Church, with its millennial-long uh, long established history, was still the most numerically dominant. And in the Siebenburger communities, Lutherism still prevailed. But many of the Calvinists did turn into non-Trinitarian followers of David, and he was soon thereafter named their bishop. Notice that I used the word non-Trinitarian. The word Unitarian was a derogatory, apathetical term until the, until the 1930s, I'm sorry, the 1630s, when David's non-Trinitarians valiantly took it on as their named identity, just as today we welcome and accept those who proudly self-label themselves queer. King Zygmunt summoned a special diet, the parliamentary meeting, at the town of Torda in 1568, which proclaimed the Edict of Torda. The kingdom would guarantee the right of the citizen to choose any of the four accepted denominations. This edict was the world's first declaration of religious toleration. However, of course, from today's perspective, it excluded Judaism, Islam, Eastern Orthodoxy, and several other groups such as the Anabaptists. Two years later, in 1570, an un, in an unusual accident, the royal coach carrying King, King Zygmunt toppled over, pinning the king who died shortly thereafter. He was only 30 years old. The selection of the next king of Transylvania was, uh, um, 
was determined that after the usual multiple claims to the throne, and eventually Istvan Bathory, a Transylvanian-born nobleman, was count, crowned king of Transylvania. Bathory was a staunch Catholic. He soon became king of Poland also. Early in his reign, he was tolerant of the four official denominations in Transylvania. He was too busy in Poland, a much bigger kingdom. During, during the next few years, Ferenc David consolidated the non-Trinitarian churches and standardized the liturgy. However, he again began questioning conventional doctrine. Why was Sunday the Sabbath day? Sunday had been declared an official day of rest by the Roman Emperor Constantine in 321 AD, and it became the unquestioned traditional cultural norm. In spiritual reading, the true Sabbath day, according to David's reflection, should begin on Friday sunset, as practiced in Judaism. David again began successfully converting congregations who would later call themselves Sabbatarians. Ferenc's new initiative caught the attention of King Bathory, and in 1578, Ferenc David, after a lengthy trial, was imprisoned in the dungeon fortress at Deva and charged with the crime of innovation. <laughs> uh, within a few months in prison, already elderly, Ferenc David passed away on November 15, 1579, leaving a message on the walls of his cell attesting to his commitment to truth. Now, what happened afterwards to the Unitarians? King Bathory tightened control of all the churches and freedoms. Soon, the apparatus of the Catholic Inquisition arrived, and the Jesuits were invited to re-educate the region. The Counter-Reformation was in full force. The Seike followers of David became isolated, surrounded by other faiths who believed that these non-Trinitarians were heretics. They were besmirched as Unitarians, that derogatory epithet for decades. The Austrian Habsburgs slowly pushed back the Ottoman Turks from Hungary by 1699. They even captured Transylvania. But the Habsburg forces stayed and became the new masters of Hungary, replacing the Ottomans. They rechained the Hungarians into their empire. The Habsburg monarchy was Catholic. The Unitarian population remained secluded, but the highly educated and theologically erudite Unitarian clergy gained their faith some respect. The ministerial leadership was continuously, had continuously elevated itself to the highest level of theological, academic, and world affairs consciousness. To become even a local Unitarian minister required the attainment of a doctorate of divinity with rigorous scholarship in philosophy and other than current academic fields. British and American Unitarians finally discovered the Transylvanian Unitarians when a Seke Unitarian writer, Alexander Farkas, visited both Great Britain and the United States between 1830 and 1832, and left pamphlets titled An Account of the Unitarians of Transylvania with both countries' national Unitarian associations. Slowly, more and more contacts were made, and both began to communicate with each other, which lasted for decades. Hungary and Transylvania now united again, but as part of the Austrian Habsburg Empire, have regrettably been on the wrong side of Anglo-American foreign policy. The Transylvanian Unitarians remained constant to themselves and within their communities. They patriotically provided the young men needed for the never-ending wars in Europe. The 20th century was exceptionally brutal. Between the two world wars, the annexation of Transylvania to Romania in 1920 whose government was dedicated to ethnic cleansing and the state-supported repopulation of Transylvania with hundreds of thousands of Romanians was a prolonged agony. The majority of Romanians are of the Eastern Orthodox faith, subtly prejudicing them against all the Seke people. In the interwar period, 
relations uh, between uh, Americans and Transylvanian Unitarian organizations again revived until the Second World War. Then afterwards, with the Russian occupation and the anti-religious policies of Soviet and Romanian communism, the Unitarians suffered severely. But with the overthrow of the tyrannical Ceausescu regime in 18, 89, 1989, in the fall of the Iron Curtain in Romania, things had become significantly better. Additionally, with Romania becoming a European Union member in 2007, membership officially mandates that minority ethnic and religious groups be treated with full rights and respect. My grandfather, upon his retirement in 1964, after serving his congregation for 52 years, his Humano St. Martin Church was blessed with the arrival of a new minister, Dr. Imre Galeir. He would serve for the next 20 years. Previous to his arrival, Dr. Galeir had suffered, had experienced five years of the horrific Romanian gulag in the 1950s for having written sermons considered antisocial by the Romanian state security apparatus. After Dr. Galeir's a tragic death in 1984, his daughter, Yurid Galeard, a physician and an accomplished violinist, immigrated to the United States and became the principal founder of the Partner Church Council of the UUA in 1993, through which American UU churches could partner with Transylvanian congregations. The council facilitated numerous people-to-people -people exchanges to the benefit of both. Dr. Yurid Galeard herself, has become an ordained American Unitarian Universalist minister, but is now retired. This has been a story of how one individual, Ferenc David, with astonishing intellect and strong dedication to truth, could transform the world, and also how a unique group of people were able to maintain their identity, community, and unity in the face of frequent adversity and malignment. It is their faith in one God, love of their traditions, rituals, reason, and their land that has sustained them. They learned as they found themselves as lambs amidst the wolves surrounding them to be wise as the serpent and peaceful as the dove. Suddenly I'm hearing church bells ringing. I'm in a foggy, semi-awakening state. I vividly see my grandfather and great-grandfather standing over me. They are both chanting, Egyazisten, emlékezz a székely magyar unitárius vallásod, vallásodra, ne hagyd el veszni erdét, Istenünk. God is one. Never forget your Hungarian székely Unitarian faith. Don't let Erde be lost, O oh, our God. Was I dreaming? I have awakened. The story is ended. Let us now rise, and Joel and I will lead us in a singing in singing our closing hymn, the Seke Aldash, Transylvanian Blessing. So we're going to uh, have Jean Boer uh, do this in um, Transylvanian first. <laughs> Hungarian, Hungarian, Hungarian. Whatever. And uh, then I will do the English part of it, a little descant. And then it's your turn. We're going to do the English one together and then have a huge finale at the end with everyone singing together, both parts.
everybody in English. Where there is faith, there is love. Where there is love, there is peace. Where there is peace, there is blessing. Where there is blessing, there is God. Where there is God, there there is Thank you, Chris. Good, good, good job, John Boy. Okay, so Peter. Before we extinguish our chalice, let, oops, thank you. Let me remind everyone that the wooden bowl and the woven baskets out in the Oasis room await your generosity. The wooden bowl for our church sustenance and the woven basket for the support of youth on their own. Yodo is a Tucson organization that works with young, homeless, unsheltered teenagers to help them get through high school and to meet the demands of life. We, members of our congregation, are part of the name of our faith tradition, Unitarian Universalism. We too have a rich tradition with roots going back to pre-revolutionary America, likely including Thomas Jefferson. And we've had two avowed Unitarian presidents, Millard Fillmore and William Howard Taft. We've also had many prominent UUs who are at the forefront of important political and social movements in our country. We extinguish our chalice in remembrance that the freedom to create one's faith or choose one's faith has been a long struggle for many throughout history. Let us realize the dreams of ancestors by creating a world dedicated to peace, harmony, tolerance, and acceptance within our universal unity. <laughs>